Welcome to the Gospel Center Pro-Life Podcast. In this episode, we're going to do an interview with Devin Palou from Ratio Christi Ministries. We're going to talk about the issue of abortion. We're going to talk about euthanasia, assisted suicide, and what it means to be made in the image of God. Stay tuned. I felt your passion, touched your heart. Welcome to the Gospel Center Pro-Life Podcast. We have with us today Devin Palou with Ratio Christi Ministries. Uh, him and his wife are at Winthrop University and other college campuses doing ministry there. Just share real quick what you guys do and, and a little bit about your ministry. Yeah, so uh, the group we're with again is Ratio Christi, which is Latin for the reason for Christ. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the people uh, that listen to this podcast may be aware of apologetics, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe for those who are not, apologetics is just uh, giving an answer or giving uh, reasons why you hold uh, the position that you hold. And so uh, a lot of different campus ministries focus on a lot of different areas that are they're all needed and they're good to have, but our area is primarily uh, apologetics. So we do uh, weekly meetings where... <coughs> You know, each semester we do a different theme. This semester is the Bible. How do you know it's true? How did we get it? How is it translated? Uh, so we're at Winthrop University. Uh, we also do some classes at York Tech Community College. Okay. Uh, tonight we kick off our high school, which is uh, Ratio Christi College Prep. Uh, and that gets col uh, high schoolers ready for college. They'll be prepared. Uh, in addition to that, we're also able to lead a professors group of some uh, amazing Christian professors on the campus at Winthrop uh, who also want to know and, and study apologetics. Um, normally, this time of the day, I'm actually doing our own podcast, okay. Theology Matters yeah, sorry with the Palouse. No, it's, hey, it's good to be here. Um, and then, um, yeah, so you can check out our YouTube page, Ratio Christi at Winthrop University. Okay, yeah. Cool. Yeah, we'll make sure and put that in the in the notes uh, sure. on the podcast, so guys can, so people can who are listening can connect with you guys. Um, so I, I wanted you to come because you know we've we've ministered before uh, right. at the abortion clinic. That's you know, primarily what we do as a ministry, Vicky and I, and then, uh, Cities for Life. Mm -hmm. And then you guys um, uh, some years back with Forty Days for Life, and you'd come out and you brought right. some groups out, and we just had the the honor to be able to minister alongside you guys, and y'all have been sort of hand-in-hand hand with what we've been doing at Cities for Life since I think Cities for Life began, so it's just a, a blessing to know you guys. And I know you've got, you know, this philosophical mind, so I wanted to kind of okay. mine your p philosophical mind. <laughs> How about that? And I wanted to talk about, as I sent you, you know, a few questions, of course, talking about the issue of abortion. That's what this podcast is about, talking about the issue of abortion in light of the gospel, um, but I think these other issues that I mentioned to you about euthanasia and assisted suicide sort of, I mean, definitely tie into this, this yeah. issue of abortion. We'll get to those issues. But just, just to ask you from your experience, you sent me a video of a young man um, who was a student at Winthrop who came initially was uh, for abortion. He was pro-choice pro and, and abortion was an okay thing. And you had talked with him and, and had some conversations with him and he actually changed his position. Yeah. on the issue of abortion, and now he's pro-life, right? Yeah. He'd say he's, he's against abortion. So what are some of those, I guess I was first ask some of those challenges when you're talking to people from a biblical and a philosophical perspective about the issue of a life, about abortion, what are some of the challenges that you find with students? Yeah, you know, um, one of the things we do when we are uh, at the campus, you know, we're at a, a secular university, um, so a lot of the students that come, they may have been brought up in the church. Mm -hmm. And so they've heard a lot of the scriptures, you know, Jeremiah, you formed me in the womb, etc. cetera. Um, but they don't really know outside of that. What are some good reasons to think, you know, life begins at conception or good reasons to think that abortion is wrong? So I think just giving them some of these answers, some of the biological answers, philosophical answers, showing them that life begins at conception... And then kind of going through a lot of the pro-choice objections. I think that's, it's, it's really key and vital because um, they need to know they're getting an onslaught of all these particular objections that are coming. Yeah. And most of the objections, as you know, they just assume that the unborn is not a human being. Sure. So what we try and do is keep laser focused on that question of what is the unborn? Mm -hmm. And then when all these objections come, just kind of walk them through how to do that. Yeah. So do you find that there's sort of a, I don't know, like a wall because they were raised in the church and then they're exposed to the university setting and the university setting and a lot of university settings, at least, it's almost 
everything that's contrary to what they yeah. learned in church. Do you find that they sort of, with their confidence in their in their university professors, sort of put up a wall against any sort of biblical truth? And then you find that's yeah. a barrier between even talking about pro-life stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes, you know, you, you have a couple of different uh, scenarios with students. Some of them... You know, they, they grew up in the church, They and, and this is not to bash the church, I love the church, sure. etc. Uh, but they go to VBS, they go to Sunday morning, they go to Sunday night, and they think, because they've had a little bit of answers in Genesis, that they know apologetics. Yeah. And then they get to the university, and they get creamed. Yeah. Um, as long as it's assumed that the Bible's the Word of God, and it's assumed there's a Christian worldview, they do okay. But the university just doesn't share those particular assumptions. Uh, and so, what a lot ha- what a lot of times what happens is um, they just end up having a lot of questions about how do I know the Bible's true? How do I know God even exists? They go home, they talk to their parents. Parents think, well, you know, you, you talk to the pastor because that's kind of his job. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, they're the pastor's getting hit with all these objections from somebody like a Richard Dawkins or Harris or these guys that are the new atheists, and they don't know how to respond because. Seminary didn't really teach them that. Yeah. And so it's kind of this, well, you just have to have faith kind of a thing, uh, which most students know rightly. It's really not a good answer. Yeah. And so they do build up this wall almost um, as though, you know, church uh, and Sunday school, that's one thing on Sundays. But things like science, biology, philosophy, that's what we do the rest of the week. Right. So it's almost these two separate categories. So when you get into the issue of abortion, it's, it's almost like they put this into the category of the science. And so, well, maybe my faith, my faith would say you shouldn't have an abortion, but, you know, through science and biology and that, you know, they're going to come to a different conclusion. They don't yeah. know how to harmonize those tools that God's given yeah, us. Yeah, sure. So what are some of the ways that you, because I know you guys do more than just trying to convince people to, you know, believe the Bible and, yeah. and believe that life uh, begins at conception. You're actually... You're not just trying to convince people. You're trying to shore up those who already believe those things, but give right. them good reasons and good answers <clears throat> to uh, to to give to those who who in their you know their peers that would ask. So, what are some of the things that you encourage students with? To, hey, this this is why we're pro life as Christians. And what are some of the things that you that you help them to shore up their their faith with? So, um, Greg Kokel, I'm sure you you know Greg Kokel's mm-hmm. ministry standards, and he wrote a really good book called Tactics. And so, in this book, Tactics, he's really teaching how to ask questions. Okay. And so, for example, when I'm talking, I remember talking to a student, and um, you know, a lot of them would would say that they are Christians, but would fall on this pro-choice side. And so, just questions. So, I, I remember asking this young man. He's saying, "Well, I'm I'm pro-choice," and I said, "Well." choice to do what? What is it that you believe women should have a choice to do? Should have a choice to have an abortion. And I asked him, well, what is an abortion? And it's almost like when I asked that, the light went on and he realized, oh, you know, it's like because you just, you hear the terms, you use the terms, but when you really think, well, what is an abortion? Right? Yeah. Then it's almost like the light turned on and he saw, that's all we, I had to do with him. Um, so that's one example. Uh, another example is just really making them define their terms. So another student would say, well, uh, abortion is a termination of a pregnancy. Uh, but, you know, when my wife gave birth to our little girl, Eliana, well, shameless plug to my yeah, little girl, amen. that pregnancy was terminated. Sure. But her life wasn't terminated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's more than just a termination of a pregnancy. Mm-hmm. So it's really making them... Um, hone in on the words that are used. What exactly is meant? Or sometimes, one more example, a student might say, well, I personally would never have an abortion, uh, but I wouldn't want to force my morality on others. So I may ask, well, why wouldn't you personally have an abortion? Well, because I believe it kills a baby. Yeah. Well, if you believe it kills a baby, why would you be okay with others having the choice to kill a baby? Yeah, and then you know, just some of those questions. I think they just haven't thought through. It's a lot of slogans within the abortion argument, and when you really drill down and make them think through it, it they can see the issues. Yeah, yeah, Vicky, we did. We've done some podcasts about. Uh, we sort of tackled the pro-choice arguments mm-hmm. for abortion, and we dealt with some of the you know biblical pro-choice arguments. I don't know if you've heard Devin. Uh, the numbers chapter. I oh, know you have the numbers chapter five passage where you know a priest is to take some dust off yeah. the, the tabernacle floor and give yeah. it. And this is supposedly a, a God induced abortion. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now I don't imagine you, you. Do you deal with that sort of thing? You, you know. 
Not, not normally. Normally, the people that we're dealing with, um, it's not. Uh, they're not trying to make a biblical case yeah. for it. Now, there are some liberal groups on campus that mm-hmm. we will, you know, interact with and um, that, but uh, they wouldn't. They wouldn't be able to. They wouldn't know those kind of arguments. So most of the things we're getting are, are the arguments like, um, you know, it's the woman's body. It's a woman's choice. Uh, you don't want to ruin her life if, if she's wanting to go finish school or you know, yeah. punish her for a mistake or something like that. So, um, or, you know, they do teach um, more of the higher level arguments in classes like Judith Jarvis Thompson's violinist sure. argument, stuff yeah, like we that. Just, we just talked we just, about that. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so do, you, do you ever have a situation where a student has come to you who is actually considering abortion and, you know, and they've come and say, Tell me why I shouldn't do this. So I, we've had some, so not students, but like my, so my wife is really the one that got me really involved in this. My right. wife has that all the time. Right. Where she's yeah. on the phone trying to talk someone out of it like that. Um, but as far as students go, we've had students come to us and say they're friends. Their friend right. is considering. Right. Right. What can I tell them? What do I say? Yeah. And, and can I ask you that? Because I know our listeners uh, being pro-life people um, <coughs> that are look, seeking oftentimes to influence their, their friends. Yeah. And, and th- you know, just some basic uh points about well where do you start and and uh, and there's two groups those who claim that they know God yeah and claim that God will be a forgiving God and we hear that all the time God will forgive me I'm going to do this or I think it's okay because we know that God will forgive and right. then those and I think this is maybe the harder group to start with because a baby's life is on the line um, it's basically crisis emergency that baby's going to die right. but they don't believe in God and so you don't have the months that you probably take typically mm-hmm. to to take someone from an atheist position yeah. all the way to this human life that you carry is precious. So if you can give some just basic, actual, practical um, things that you would say in both of those scenarios, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah. So I, I think with, of course, with the biblical scenario, you're just wanting to remind them, hey, if you are a <clears throat> Christian, what is your authority, right? And they know, you know, if you're a Christian, it's the Bible. We talk a lot about the worldview and how we see the world. And the Bible is like the lens in which we see the world. And so what does the Bible say about these things? So the Bible may not explicitly use the word abortion, but it talks about, you know, uh, murder. It talks about, you know, unjust killing. And so you have to look at does abortion fall into that? And then you can show that it it does. Mm -hmm. With the other case where they're not Christians, see, there is uh, general revelation and special revelation. <coughs> general revelation is what God has revealed to us through nature. You see Romans 1 talk about this. Well, people know the difference between right and wrong. You may not be able to drill down on all the exact you know, minutia of the particular right and wrong, but in general, people know it's wrong to torture babies rather than, than love them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so... With general revelation, most people know the difference between right and wrong. If, if you ask, is it okay to kill a baby after birth, 99% of atheists are going to say, no, it's not. They know that. Even right. though they, they don't believe that God exists, because God does exist, there's this grounding and foundation. It's what they would you know, call like the ontological foundation to where uh, there is a moral standard, mm-hmm. even if they don't believe God exists. And mm-hmm. so you can appeal to that. But what I, what I do is just... Um, look at what is the scientific evidence. When does life begin? So I would just use a very simple uh, deductive argument. Premise one, whatever be, uh, I'm sorry, I'm giving a kalam there, a different <laughs> argument. Um, premise one, um, it is wrong to intentionally take the life of an innocent human being. Premise two, abortion takes the life of an innocent human being, therefore abortion is wrong. So Mm -hmm. they're going to have to show, okay, is premise one or premise two false? Mm -hmm. And I've never had anybody be able to give an answer to that. Because most are going to grant, yeah, it is wrong to intentionally take the life of an innocent human being. So the next step is, okay, does abortion do this? Mm -hmm. Um, If life begins at conception, it it does. Mm -hmm. And that's where I will marshal the scientific evidence from the embryology textbook, biology textbooks, Mm -hmm. and demonstrate the authority show life begins at conception. Right, right. Will will you try to steer them then at at some point, or at what point would you steer them into the truth of the gospel? Because ultimately, if you're going to truly change the heart that that says, you know, that I'm going to abort, then 
we know yeah. that it has to come through a change in our soul, in our heart towards yeah. God. I, I think once they see that, um, once they can be shown that it is a human being, then you can get into some of those arguments of, well, it has an uh, intrinsic value because people are made in the image of God. You know, one of the big things today is the LGBT or discrimination. So you can give examples. Is it wrong to uh, beat up a homosexual just because, uh, you know, they're attracted to the same sex, right? Mm -hmm. Theologically, obviously, we don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't say somebody should be beat up. Exactly. Yeah. Why? Well, right. because they're human beings, they have intrinsic value, they're made in the image of God, and therefore they should be valued. Okay, well now, the atheist is not going to agree with that. That's what gives them oh, value. Oh, right. Yeah. So where do you, how do okay, you get, so that's, I, that's kind of what I'm asking is, how, how do I, do you how get do I them give from, arguments for God's existence? Is that it? Well, for the value, for the value of that child. Okay. What gives that child value? Where, where does an atheist typically start? And how do you lead them to, to what we know to be true, that human beings have value because they're made in the image of a holy God? Yeah, so I mean, uh, I think most atheists, because, I mean, if most of them, I guess, would probably have more of like an evolutionary view of humanity. Yes, yeah. So they, would, they may say that higher forms have more value. Um, again, I'm not saying it's consistent, but would say it, it, they have a higher value than other lower life forms that way. Therefore, um, you know, abortion... Because you actually have secular pro-life groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sure. The problem right. is, and I've, I've talked with several of them, the problem is they do have a hard time grounding it. They can mm -hmm. point to natural law and they can point to these things that show uh, we, it is a human being, we should have value, but they really a lot of times do have a hard time showing why do we have more value than, for example, a puppy or a bear. Mm -hmm. So I can't really make that argument. I don't know mm -hmm. why they, they hold that. I've, I've, I've had these conversations and... Uh, with them and a lot of the secular pro-life don't necessarily know exactly how that's grounded. Mm -hmm. um, as far as getting them to kind of our position is therefore, you know, you'd have to get more into the arguments for God's existence. So cosmological okay. arguments mm -hmm. like the, or, you know, origins of the universe, fine tuning of the universe, the design, showing that it's, we're not an accident. It didn't just come about by chance and showing that there's a purpose and a design and a plan behind it. And then that kind of, you know, is going to show up. You can show God created the universe mm -hmm. and that life didn't come from non-living material. Then we do have value. We do have dignity and we're not our own. Okay, now let me ask you. So I'm in front of an abortion <coughs> clinic. I'm, I'm with an atheist mom. And, and I agree with you. I totally agree with you. I think that is where you have to start. Can we do that in five minutes or? Yeah. <laughs> and it, can, can you give me an, like the example of what you might say that can lead them to that that place of what understanding would you, if you want to play the the do a little role play oh, okay yeah. okay yeah. It's hard, right. yeah that way i know All exactly right. how i would respond okay it's it's not a baby it it's a clump of cells okay and Perfect. and and look you believe in god I don't. Okay. So, you know, I'm not worried about where I'm going. I'm, I'm right. going to turn into dust. You know, the worms right. are going to eat me. I, there is no such thing as heaven or hell. And, and right now, this baby's going to destroy my life. And I'm here. And right. I'm alive. And, yeah. and I need, I've got plans. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there. There, there we go. <laughs> the so worst I, case scenario, you got it, Deborah. There you go. <laughs> I would say, you know, when she says, uh, you know, I don't believe in God and this baby's just a clump of cells. Well, if God doesn't exist, then all you are is just a clump of cells. Would it be okay to kill you? Or would it be okay to kill one of your loved ones? If all we are, if there is no God, if all it is is nature, and if all we are is clumps of cells, well, you wouldn't. Say it would be okay to kill you, right? Well, yeah, but I'm clumps of cells that think and know that I'm alive and, you know, I'm conscious and I'm breathing and okay. all that stuff. Okay, so why would, it, why, would, why, does, why would that be morally relevant? Why does it matter if something is conscience, uh, conscious in order to have value? What, what makes being conscious, what gives it value? That's a good question. Yeah. For example, how would they? <laughs> well, you, you know, just don't be atheist. <laughs> you know, it just depends how, how they might go. You know, you could give an example. Um, are are rats conscious? Mm -hmm. And most people are going to say, well, yeah, rats. Are, well, then are rats persons? Are rats people? Would it be wrong to kill rats if you have a rat infestation and you gas the rats? You know, um, is that going to be? Is that the same as murder? Right? We know intuitively, even if the person doesn't acknowledge that God exists, we know in our conscience there is a difference between killing a baby and killing a rat. Now, the distinction, I think, that needs to be made with the pro-life and pro-choice um, position, 
I don't believe at the foundation. Now, you do have some that are, are going to argue this, but I think the vast majority of the confusion is not, is it okay to kill babies? Because if you talk to a lot of pro-choice people, the issue is more, the confusion is when does life begin? Yeah. And you know this because the vast majority of pro-choice people are against abortion in the second and third trimester. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right? And so it's yeah. more of, well, when does life begin? It's not... The majority of people say, hey, it's okay to kill babies, yeah. right? Because if that was the case, most of them would not be for uh, are restricting abortions in the third or the second trimester. Yeah. You, know, you know, it's funny. I mean, I have conversations all the time uh, with pro-choice people in front of the abortion clinic. So these are probably some of the most, I mean, I don't know, but I, I'm thinking probably some of the most radical you know, pro-choice, I yeah. call them pro-abortion people that you can meet because they're actually taking the step of being in front of an abortion clinic to oppose <laughs> what we're doing. Yeah. And even with those people, when I ask them the question, it's like, you know, as far as when, when does life begin? When does life begin? They can tell you when life doesn't begin, yeah. <laughs> but they can never really tell you when life does begin. Right. Um, so they'll say, well, it, it, certainly not in the first trimester. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And probably not even in the second trimester. Some of them. Some of them are, are 20 weeks. Some of them are 24 weeks, 22 weeks. I've heard different different yeah. numbers. I'm like, so I argued with one of them, you know, not argued, but I you know, just gave yeah. this argument that, hey, so I'm taking the position of I know when life begins. You're taking a position where you don't really know. If that building over there, you know, someone was about to wreck it with a wrecking ball, and I asked you, is there any living people in there? Like, yeah. have they checked it? And you said, I don't know. Right. <laughs> then wouldn't we, like, err on the side of, well, if you don't know when life begins, why don't we just protect all yeah. potential lives and you can stand with me, and we'll stand against abortion. Um, yeah, and which I don't know is the best best. No, it way is. To go about I mean, it, but. yeah. Pre I remember when President Obama was asked, you know, this with Rick Warren, uh, when does life begin? And he's, well, it's above my pay grade. Yeah. yeah. Well, then yeah. why would you be for, uh, you know, yeah. putting all these laws in to to move restrictions on abortion if you could potentially be killing a yeah. human being? Yeah. You exactly. Know? If, if you you know if you don't know. Don't shoot. Yeah. So there's yeah there's yeah. like this win in doubt throw it out sort of, but, sort of mentality. But is. one thing I would say you know is in you know for your listeners it is not a mystery when life begins. Like yeah. That is right. a biological right. fact. Right. Now some pro choice um, some of the philosophers try and make a distinction between being a human being and a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you have to get into some of those arguments and show why um, you know the, there's no real morally relevant difference. Yeah. But that life begins at conception. That's just, we've known that for a yeah. long time. You know, I've had pro-choice people say, um, you know, using science, and they say, you know, science science proves that life doesn't begin at conception. I'm like, really? Cause, or that personhood doesn't begin. At, science proves that these babies aren't persons. That's that's the argument. There's, yeah. I was like, well, wait a minute. Like, person is not really a scientific term. Right. That's a all. philosophical term. You're making, I'm making a philosophical argument when I say human beings are intrinsically valuable and that that person in the womb, that baby in the womb, is a person. Yeah. You're also making a philosophical argument when you're saying it's not a person. Yeah. And and, and I know you deal with a lot of that philosophical, you know, stuff. You know, mm -hmm. you deal with those thoughts. Um, and so you know, you guys already talked through some of that and how to talk to an atheist in front of an, an abortion clinic. But what are some of the, I guess, most relevant philosophical arguments when you're talking about abortion? I think you've already shared some of that. But even some of the, you know, I guess, higher arguments about abortion. Because when you get into talking about life begins at conception, I think most thinking pro-choice people have sort of said, yeah, life, of course, mm -hmm. it begins at conception. Even you've got some, some very prominent pro-choice yeah. advocates that say, yeah, I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. Mm -hmm. Even with the, the violinist argument, yeah. share, they're like, mm -hmm. I'll grant you that this is a person, but does this person have the right to take over another person's body? Yeah. So what are some of those higher arguments, or at least some ways to combat some of those higher pro-choice arguments, if you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So <laughs> some of those arguments, like you just mentioned, like the violinist argument, those are, those are some of the harder ones to defeat because... Um, in most of the arguments, most of most of the pro-choice people, we're not talking in academia, but just most of the people you're going to run into at the grocery store or whatever, they're not aware of those kind of arguments. Yeah, yeah. Most it's of most them, emotional arguments, right? right? And yeah. they, they, they almost always <clears throat> beg the question as to uh, when life begins, you know. But some of the higher level arguments like the Judith Jarvis Thompson's violinist arguments, they're hard because they grant that it's a human being. Yeah. 
And so really what you need to show, because with, I think, the, the, that particular violinist argument is trying to argue from analogy, what you're trying to show is really where the analogies break down. Sure. Mm-hmm. So, for example, with the violinist argument, um, it's funny, I'm doing a, uh, a 15-week course at our, it's on our Sunday school church on this issue. Okay. I think last week was this argument. So. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, so I mean, we just did a podcast last week about that. this argument. Yeah. 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 Really, really, it's not a question of when life begins, but a question of when is that life valuable? Because right. I think they will grant us, most of the time they will say it's alive at some level, but okay. it's of lesser value. And I think for me, that's what the higher level argument is, is when does value, when when is value yeah. conferred upon that child? Yeah, so with, with some of the, you know, we, we were just talking about this. Some of them would say, well, because um, it's, it's not conscious. So maybe what I would say is what makes somebody a human being? Mm-hmm. What What is it that makes someone valuable or makes someone a human being? And so you may get this thing like, well, um, it's, it's conscience or it has sentience, etc. Um, but again, you have things like rats or kangaroos. These things also have consciousness, but we, we wouldn't say that they're persons. Um, what about people who are in comas, for example, that don't have that? Um, are they still considered persons? Uh, and so I think it's trying to flush out their inconsistencies. If they're going to say a human, it's a human, but it's not a person with value, it's really, the onus is not me to disprove them. They have to give reasons as to why it's morally relevant. Uh, what's the difference between a human being and a person? Mm-hmm. And all these little, you know, things that they have, such as, you know, consciousness, etc. cetera, um, when you just apply them, it ends in, abs- in absurdity. Mm-hmm. So somebody that's yeah. in a coma, can you kill them? Well, but then euthanasia, as we know, they, they are killing people in comas. Right. Yeah. And, um, so, but uh, there's a distinction there. Most of the people that do the euthanasia, they want to die. The baby doesn't have that choice. Right. They're right. not given a voice. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a difference between people that just they have this terminally ill disease, they don't want to live anymore, and, you know, somebody that, uh, you know, they're just pulling the plug and somebody doesn't even yeah. have a say. Yeah. And even yeah. with that, you know, one of the distinctions um, also, you know, we talk about the violinist argument. Yeah. Um, it's not just withholding. <clears throat> it's actually actively murdering. Right? Yeah. Right. So with yeah. abortion, it's like, you know, you're slitting the throat. You're not just unplugging from the, the violinist. Now, with euth- euthanasia, it is also not just passive, but it is an act of killing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, I mean, we can talk about some of the Yeah, yeah, let's jump into that because I did want to talk about, the you know, the primary focus is the issue of abortion. But I think these issues, I'm reading stuff, yeah. you know, um, from pro-choice uh, or pro-life, sorry, sources online. Yeah. Uh, talking about assisted suicide, euthanasia, and that sort of thing. One young lady, I don't know if you read this story, one young lady, I think she was 23, mm. 23 years old. I believe it was in the Netherlands. It was somewhere across the pond there. Um, and uh, 23 years old, no physical issues really going on, but she had extreme depression. Uh, she had been, I think, a sexually a victim of sexual molestation or something wow. like that, and just dealing with this depression. Her psychologist or psychiatrist or whatever um, – you know, kind of threw meds at it, counseling, whatever, and I guess she'd been in some kind of counseling. Anyway, long story short, they basically said, hey, listen, there's nothing else we can do for you. The best thing you could do probably is is, is assisted suicide. Yeah, yeah and awful. like 23 years old, they basically told her, the people who are supposed to help her basically told her, sorry, there's no real help for you. Your life really is not worth living. I mean, that to me, that's what mm-hmm. they're telling them. Yeah, that is. <clears throat> and there's a story in Canada, a young man, I think 39 years old or maybe early 40s not you know not terribly old had some some uh some illness where he needed ongoing treatment and whatever I mean he, the guy's still functional you know he's right. not like completely like you know vegetable or whatever uh, still functional but basically they were he had to have ongoing care in home care and they basically said hey listen the money's run out for this thing and we really can't do anything else this is probably your best option, which is wow. you know, euthanasia or you know, assisted suicide. So, you know, those stories grieve me yeah. because what it seems to me is, as a society, the very thing that that us Christians have warned about for a long time, which is this whole assisted suicide, euthanasia, abortion thing, has stripped away the intrinsic value of human life, mm-hmm. and now we're on a da- downward spiral where you know we're going to be putting people in old folks' homes to death. We're going to be, I mean, it's happening. Cheaper, yeah. yeah. Cheaper yeah, it's than cheaper because we're looking at the numbers and we're looking at, I mean, if you come from an atheistic, naturalistic mindset, 
then human beings are nothing more than just evolved yeah, animals. That's it. So, so how do you how do you tie these these those issues in together? Euthanasia, assisted suicide, um, abortion. I don't really want to talk about the death penalty. <laughs> I, I do want to have that conversation. I think we, we're going to do a podcast about that because I think that's an important subject. Yeah. But I think it is a separate issue because we're dealing with you know a guilty party, and there's some arguments to be made on both sides. I believe right. for that, but. Just those three issues, euthanasia, euthanasia, assisted suicide, and abortion. How do those tie in together in your mind from a philosophical Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think a lot of it is um, because it is, it's, it's viewed as more of this functionalist view of a human being rather than the intrinsic value of a human yeah. being. So it's because, uh, you know, these people are old. They can't offer anything. They can't contribute anything. Therefore, they don't have value. Yeah. Same thing is kind of conferred on the unborn, right? Is mm-hmm. uh, they're not, they don't, they're just these parasites. They're not offering anything. They're not helping. They're just sucking resources, mm-hmm. uh, and so it's it's looked at more of like uh, what can you do rather than you're valuable for who you are. Yeah. So a lot of the arguments that go for euthanasia uh, and abortion really go hand in glove. Yeah. And it's because it's this idea, this worldview that, you know, we're just we're molecules in motion, nothing outside of the box. Uh, and so um, Dr. Geisler and Dr. Turk wrote a really good book, Legislating Morality. Uh, also, Dr. Geisler's Christian Ethics that has whole chapters on these issues. Um, but what they show in legislating morality was so many of these people, you know, you talk about in the, in the Netherlands where this is, you know, legal, um, who were going to do it, they didn't end up doing it. And they were so glad they didn't. Yeah. It was a time of depression. It was something that they fell into, but it passed. Yeah. You know, these consequences are, are eternal when you're talking, mm-hmm. convincing somebody, well, you know, you might as well just, you know, kill yourself because it's not going to get better. Yeah. That is, you know, when the horse falls down and breaks the leg and you take it out back and shoot it. That's yeah. what we do with animals. That's right, yeah. We don't do that with human beings. And it's mm-hmm. because human beings uh, are valuable. And we would say ultimately as Christians, it's it's grounded in because we're made in the image of God. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, and most people, again, I think... They know human beings are valuable. They may not know how to ground that exactly. Um, but, yeah, pe- most people, if you ask, are humans more valuable than a cockroach? They're yeah. going to say, yeah, humans more. And what it shows is, betrays to the atheist is their inconsistent worldview. Yeah. Because if they were consistent with their worldview, we really wouldn't be. Yeah. We're just molecules in motion. Yeah. Yeah, or sure. we do sink to the level of where human life really has then ceased to have value. And we are a society that is uh, slouching towards uh, all of these horrific, really, forms of murder. Yeah. Abortion, assisted suicide, and um, and euthanasia. Yeah. Do, do you think that that's true? Though? I mean, I think it is just from observation. But just even conversations with, with students and stuff, do you see that society is sort of going toward this downward spiral of, of human beings no longer have intrinsic value or just like animals? Do, do you see that in conversations? I don't know. It's a good question. See, some of the polls that I've seen recently show there's actually a spike in okay. people that hold to the pro-life position. Yeah. So, I, again, I think a lot of it is there is this confusion of when does life begin. Um, I think if it really... If we were really seeing that, then these numbers of second, third trimesters, people should be okay with it. Yeah. But most people aren't. Right. So I almost see it as this view of uh, natural law or natural theology where people see it's a general revelation that even if their worldviews are inconsistent with it, we know it's wrong mm-hmm. to torture babies for fun or you know murder innocent human beings. We know it. Yeah. We know it. We suppress it, Romans 1 says. Mm-hmm. We try and suppress that. Yeah. But we know it. And yeah. I don't think we can ever get rid of that, even if we sink to some pretty evil things. Yeah. So, okay, so a thought comes to mind. Um, I mentioned we, we, me and Vicki did a podcast, uh, and we mentioned the Judith Jarvis Thompson argument. Yeah. We, the podcast was focused around sort of my body, my choice, and this self-idolatry, yeah. right, that, that yeah. self is God. And that, you know, God no longer enters into the equation. So, you know, could it be with, with euthanasia and with assisted suicide? Because I hear when I talk to some pro-choice people, and they talk about assisted suicide, and they talk about euthanasia, uh, mainly about assisted suicide, and the arguments that they use for that are like bodily autonomy arguments, yeah. right? A person has a right to have themselves put to death, right? Yep. And, and so do you see that sort of as being a separation between... 
the issue of abortion and assisted suicide and that sort of thing. You understand what I'm what I'm getting? Yeah. So you're saying like with with that is that they want their they want to control their own destiny. Right. Yeah. Right, they know? want to control their own destiny. But then you're saying, and I think the numbers, yeah, definitely the numbers bared out where you're seeing more and more people becoming pro life. Yeah. So they're sort of like even in, within the pro choice people that we would kind of lump together with, you know, they're pro-abortion, they're pro-euthanasia, pro-assisted suicide. There's kind of a divide there yeah. in those people. So, yeah. so that more of them are seeing the inconsistencies and in sort of the my, my body, my choice argument for abortion. Right. They can see the consistencies maybe with that for suicide, but, but for abortion they're starting to say, okay, science is showing us that this is a separate body, a separate person. Right. You think that's sort of what's going yeah, on with yeah, that? Yeah, I think it is because like with the, like you're saying with the abortion, it's, it's, there's another person in play. Yeah. As to where euthanasia, it's just them. And it's, you know, this idea of, of this death with dignity. But in reality, it's cowardice. Yeah. It really is cowardice. Okay. I mean, they're, you, you, ha- you don't know if God's going to heal you. Mm-hmm. You don't know what God's going to do through that with yeah. other people. Mm-hmm. Your body is not your own. Your life is not yeah. your own. It doesn't mean you have to go through extraordinary means to stay alive. Mm-hmm. You know, we got a friend who, you know, the, the mom's like in her 90s and, you know, stage four, you know, renal mm-hmm. failure and all these things. She's, she's going to die. So mm-hmm. obviously you wouldn't say, you know, if she starts to go to, you know, resuscitate and all that that's mm-hmm. that's that's not the same uh but uh, you know it's it's this idea that you know um it's my body i can do what i want it's my decision and it's just not you know especially if you're a christian that's yeah. definitely not the way it is yeah you know um it is uncertain it is unknown you don't know what you're going to get I, you know it's it's but it's trusting in god he may, may heal you he may not but he can use your story and you to bring other people to the kingdom. And at the end of the day, that is a Christian. That's the goal. Yeah. yeah. Right? And Absolutely, yeah. Um, if, if you could talk about, because um, I hear this all the time in all three of those areas, that um, but this prevents um, unbearable suffering. And uh, we, we would kill our dog. Mm-hmm. We, we take our dog yeah. to be euthanized when our dog is, is, it took me a long time before I was able to do that, but we do do that, most of us do, yeah. to prevent suffering. So, and that argument is used in all three of those cases, euthanasia, abortion, and, um, and assisted suicide, is there is unbearable suffering. Suffering to the mother in the case of abortion, she is going to suffer, or sometimes in the case of the baby, the baby is going to be born with some hor- horrific disease that is only going to cause suffering their entire Life. So biblically, can you talk to that? How do you yeah. dismantle that? Well, like with that that example of, well, the baby's going to be born and it's going to have these particular physical problems, I would say you, you, you would treat that the same way you would as if a toddler was in a terrible car accident and they were going to, you know, die soon. You wouldn't get a pillow and smother it or take it out back right. and shoot it. You'd offer comfort and love and hope you know as it as it um as the baby passes away as far as uh being against it because of the unbearable suffering etc well i mean you know nobody wants to suffer but good things can happen through our suffering Mm -hmm. look at the cross look Mm -hmm. at jesus right uh good things can happen through the suffering and it is uh, a testimony of god working in us through us and with other people the reason we don't take human beings out back and shoot them like an animal or take them to the vet and right. euthanize them like mm-hmm. a dog. It's because of that. We're not animals. We're humans. Yeah. We're yeah. different. That's why there's a distinction there. Right. We, don't treat, we don't treat humans like dogs or horses. Yeah, yeah. and that's, you know, our, our, our main goal, I was actually, again, again, talking to one of the pro-choice ladies and, and just sharing with her, you know, our goal is we want to say babies in front of the abortion clinic. Mm-hmm. We're there to speak on behalf of those babies. But another sort of secondary, maybe not secondary, I don't know, just maybe an, an overarching sort of a reason why we're out there is to protect and guard the value of human life. Mm-hmm. You know, I sort of see it as in my city, there's 30 people that are going to die. And I know where it's going to happen. I know when it's going to happen. And in order to guard those individuals, but also to guard this thing called the sanctity of human life or the intrinsic value of human life, if that's happening in my city and I don't do something about it, then I'm sort of I'm sort of part of the problem. Now, th- I don't mean that as condemnation for people that right, are not involved right. in what I'm doing. I'm not saying what yeah. I'm doing is the most important, although I think it might be. <laughs> but I think it's very important. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, when we, you know, it ties into a lot. When we when we talk about the intrinsic value of human life, and then we really do nothing. We turn a blind eye to what's going on. It's it sort of 
chips away at that, and we sort of add to this idea that human life maybe doesn't have any value. Look, even the Christians don't care so much. Right. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the things that we do, and I, with the pro-choice lady, I told her, listen, you're here, and I think you're here to guard something that to you is very precious, yeah. which is a woman's right to choose. Now, right. from my perspective, it's a woman's right to choose to kill her child, right? Yeah. But I understand you're guarding something that's precious to you. But understand that we're also trying to guard something that's precious to us. Those individual babies, but also the sanctity of human life. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to from, you know, an apologetics, biblical and philosophical perspective, kind of how we, as believers, guard human, the, the sanctity of human life and how we uphold that value so that society, secular society and whatever, religious society, looks and says, okay, there is something to what these Christians are saying. How do we, how do we give those good philosophical arguments, biblical arguments, and, and maintain that? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to showing um, when life begins, um, because life begins at conception. Uh, we're human beings. We're not, you know, other than that. Uh, and because human beings, I mean, it, it's going to go right back to really special revelation. Okay. How do we know we're different than pandas and bears? Yeah. Why do we have more value? Well, I'm not going to find that in nature, other than if I was to look maybe at some of these, like, well, you know, we can think and we can do more. Um, yeah, but it needs to be specially revealed to us that mm -hmm. we have souls. We, uh, we have eternal life if we believe in Jesus. Um, not even angels, you know, have these things. They're not made in the image of God. People are made in the image of God. Yeah. And so we just deduce that basically through a proper worldview, which is a Christian worldview, um, and know that we have dignity, we have value, we are made in the image of God uh, because the Bible is true and it can be shown to be true because Jesus rose from the dead. There's good arguments to believe Jesus rose from the dead, good arguments to believe that God created the universe. And so if Jesus is God, whatever Jesus teaches is true. Jesus teaches, uh, you know, man is made in the image of God, therefore humans have special yeah. uh, intrinsic value. Yeah. So when you're dealing with, I mean, ultimately, it, to me, it does come back around to the gospel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It comes back around to what God did on behalf of, of human beings. Right. You know, I'm sort of a, you know, I know people that are presuppositional apologists and yeah. like take a hard line approach on that stuff. And if you're yeah. making arguments for the existence of God, you're sort of outside the, yeah. the, the boundaries there. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm almost that, actually. Okay. But then I'm not that. You Good. know, because I make arguments don't for the existence. Yeah, I, I don't think I will be because I think yeah. actually the Scripture gives us good reason to argue from creation that there's a God and all these yeah. all these other things. But it it really does come back down to sharing uh, from the truth of God's Word and and that that point that you made. And I, I probably asked this with with well, I asked this. I don't know if you know who Jason Jimenez is. Yeah. But we've talked about you know he's an apologist uh, guy and does a lot of apologetic stuff and. And we've talked about it, Vicky and I have talked about this image of God thing. Mm -hmm. Like this, this, this idea that human beings are made in the image of God, mm -hmm. which I think it ultimately comes back to. Mm -hmm. And then we see, of course, Jesus coming and, um, and really showing you know, sort of the value of what it is to be made in the image of God by laying his life down to redeem those who are made in the image of God. Jesus didn't die for angels. Right. He didn't die for dogs or cats. He didn't die for, you know, Whatever he di he died for human beings, but if you could real quick, because th th I don't know if there's any like perfect definition for this, but just give me an idea of what you think the Bible teaches about being made in the image of God and yeah. what that what that means. How we wrap our minds around that concept? It's a, yeah, that's a good question, and it, you know I don't know if there is a single answer because you have a lot of theologians that will debate that uh, exactly what it means. I think you can know some things that it's not. Yeah, it doesn't mean physically, okay. right? Because um, well, let's see, John uh, 4.24, you know, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Luke 24.39, a spirit does not have um, flesh and blood, you know, as you see I have. So therefore, you know, if, if God is a spirit, spirits don't have flesh and blood. God doesn't have flesh and blood. Yeah, sure. Jesus, human nature, etc. But yeah. yeah, so God is not a physical being. Um, I think what you could say is, is it's uh, some of the things we know it is, we have the ability to think. We have the ability to be rational. We have the ability to ponder things, uh, the meaning of life. Why are we here? Where do we go when we die? Um, is certain you know propositions true or false? We can debate those things. It seems to be one of the you know the big distinction between us and other 
animals. There's some yeah. intelligence and some other animals, but not where you're seeing the artwork, uh, prayer, meditation, writing books, music. It seems to be something, you know, uh, in the in the rational <coughs> soul that separates us from other animals. Yeah. You, you think creativity... Yeah, ties into that you know god is yeah. obviously creative yeah and you see all that he's made uh the thought just popped in the mind it's like man what you're saying this is like creativity this is the the ability to invent new things yeah. and, and to come up with new concepts and ideas and, and and art and all those things um because to me that is a that is a deep question mm-hmm. it's a question i think we as christians need to have the best answer we can yeah. for but also to ponder because I think it's you know it's deep in the sense that it calls us to self reflect. What does it mean mean for me to be made in the image of God? Right. And and what does that entail? If I'm made in the image of God, how does that? How am I to live? You yeah. being made in the image of God. Well, and you got groups like Mormons <clears throat> that go really wrong on that and end up with God who is a a physical being. So yeah. it not only affects their view of them, but also affects their view of who God is. Yeah. So yeah. it's an important question for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Related to that, uh, would you say that that is the absolute basic truth of what gives us value is the fact that we are made in the image of God? Would that be the verse? Yeah, that- I mean, I don't see I don't see the way around it. I mean, I know how to off, I know how to debate with it. You know, with an atheist, he's using kind of natural law. But as far as getting down to the grounding as to, well, why are human beings more special than other creatures? I don't see how you get out of it other than we're made in the image of God. Right, right. And, and the that, Christian that, worldview is true. You know? And, and what, something else that one of you said about um, what is the meaning in life. So, so another way of saying that, what is our purpose? And does yeah. the Bible address that? What is our purpose, a general purpose? We all have specific yeah. purposes but what is our general purpose biblically because yeah. i think that is related very much to what we're discussing it is it's to know him know jesus and to make him known mm-hmm. right yeah. that's that is the whole purpose of life being united mm-hmm. to christ you mm-hmm. know when we love somebody, to love somebody is to will the best for that person. Mm-hmm. If I love Daniel, the best for Daniel is what? Mm-hmm. United to Jesus Christ. Right. If I love my Muslim neighbor, what's the best thing I can do? It is not affirm him and, hey, whatever yeah. you believe is great. That is hating. <clears throat> right, yeah. The best thing I can do to love him is share the gospel. Mm-hmm. My pro-choice friend, right? What's the best thing I can do? See her united to Jesus Christ. Yeah. That abortion is going to cause pain suffering, you know, she's going to have a hard time with that the rest of her life. Right. And the baby will end up dead. Yeah. You know, so if I love them, the best thing I can do, uh, introduce her to Jesus Christ who can heal her and, and, and raise from the dead. Yeah. Amen. That's, that's good. Well, I mean, I think with that, man, uh, I think we'll wrap this, this thing up. If you're cool with that, if you, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to Oh, uh, maybe just real quick, the Life House. Me and my wife are on okay, the board yeah, yeah. the Life House. It's yeah. in Rock Hill. Um, you know, uh, we don't, we're not making any money off of it or anything, but it's a place, I think it holds about five beds for women who are in crisis pregnancy mm-hmm. issues. So if you guys, you know, anybody out there listening, if you run across the a woman or whatever that is pregnant and is need of, of housing in that, mm-hmm. um, you know, contact uh, the Life House. Okay. It's in Rock it's Hill. Rock Hill Li- Life House yeah. in Rock Hill. What age? Is there an age specification on how young yeah, and how old? I don't or? think so. Nope. Okay. No, nope. we can okay. take teenagers, and Good. sometimes that's, a, you know, the best situation. Yeah. So. And how do people get in touch with you? Yeah, um, if you go to uh, Devin or Melissa Plu at Ratio Christie, our, our page will pull right up. Okay. And uh, look at our, our YouTube page, uh, Ratio Christie Winthrop, and all of our talks that we do, they're on online. Okay, cool. And you guys do a podcast, too, you said. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Theology Matters with the Palouse. Been doing that for about eight years now. Okay, Theology Matters with the Palouse. I'll, I'll do my best to try to put a link to all this stuff sure. in the in the show notes on the, uh, on the podcast. And really, thank you, know, thank you guys. You guys are out here doing... Doing the heavy lifting. Oh, and, it's by uh, the grace of God. You, really yeah, it's a privilege. Truly yeah. a privilege. You guys do a great, yeah. great work. You, you think you would, uh, you'd feel qualified? I know you'd be more than qualified to come back at some point and talk about the issue of the death penalty. Is I'd that love something to, you yeah. pondered? And you oh t- yeah. yeah, yeah, because you're always <clears throat> accused of being a hypocrite. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to talk thing. about that. Yeah. I, we can't get into that on this on this episode. Yeah, but, you yeah. let me know, man. Okay. We'll yeah, we'll do that in the in the coming weeks or months. But yeah, so we appreciate all those who have listened and. 
And we appreciate you joining in with us. Appreciate you, Devin, coming. Thanks for having um, me. You know how to get in touch with us if you've listened to the podcast, but I'll mention it again. You can get in touch with me, dparks at citiesforlife.com, cities4, the number 4, life.com. You can get in touch with Vicky v. Cassiorg at citiesforlife.com. Our website is charlotte.citiesforlife.org. And then we have, again, as we mentioned often, a national website to help just tra- train and equip sidewalk counselors because that's I think that's, that's our calling. That's mm-hmm. what we do. I think we do it pretty well. And that is uh, www.sidewalks, the number four, life.com. And that's just an equipping website. So you can get on there and get some information about sidewalk counseling. Also, send us some some questions, uh, maybe some things that you, some jet suggestions, things we could do better on the podcast, questions that we can answer or try to answer, guests that maybe we can have on. And, uh, and we'd love to hear from you guys on that end. But other than that, we appreciate you listening and God bless. Use me, Lord, oh, use me, Lord.